Well, as we continue our series, Party Time, I invite you to open your Bible to 2 Samuel, chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 12 through 23, 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 23. A couple of Saturday nights ago, I was watching little Lawrence Welk on PBS. Yeah, we McCallums know how to do Saturday night. Well, I like most all kinds of music, but the reason I watch Lawrence every now and then is because I remember my grandmother, with whom we lived, sitting in her rocking chair, watching Lawrence Welk every Saturday night. And so I tune in once in a while so I can remember her, think of her, still feel a little connection with her. Maybe my favorite segment of the show is when Arthur Duncan does his tap dance routine. He was tearing it up a couple of weeks ago. And I said to Dana, I wish I could have had tap dance lessons when I was a kid. I mean, it is percussive, it's free, it's expressive, you get to wear pretty cool shoes, and it's good exercise. But no tap dance lessons for me. My parents made me take accordion lessons. And that's unfortunate, because unless it was John Candy's polka band in Home Alone, nobody ever sang a song called, Some Days You Gotta Play the Accordion. But the Dixie Chicks and later James Taylor sang the song, Some Days You Gotta Dance. Some Days You Gotta Dance, Live It Up When You Get the Chance, Because When the World Doesn't Make No Sense, And You're Feeling Just a Little Too Tense, You Gotta Loosen Up Those Chains and Dance. David had one of those days in Jerusalem. He was on a roll. He was the undisputed king of Israel. He had captured Jerusalem and had made that the capital city. He whooped the Philistines and sent them scurrying back home like whimpering pups. He had the world by the tail, and he was thankful to God. But there was one piece of unfinished business to tend to, the cherry that would be on the hot fudge Sunday of David's success would be to bring the Ark of the Covenant home to Jerusalem. And David is going to make that happen. Because the Ark is not a museum piece to Israel. It is a sign of God's deliverance of their ancestors from Egyptian slavery. It's a reminder of the mighty acts that God did to conquer the the promised land. And in the days before the temple, the Ark symbolized the presence and power of God like nothing else. David knows this, so he wants the ark in Jerusalem. He wants a tangible reminder before the people that they are God's people, that they are in covenant with God, and that they are called to worship and serve God and God alone. It's not a surface thing with David. It's a soul thing. This is not some political stunt. This is an act of worship. So he rallies 30,000 troops, and he sets out to bring the ark home. It proves to be more challenging than expected. The law specifies that the ark is to be carried on the shoulders of priests by two poles that have been threaded alongside the ark. And I wonder if David was thinking something like this. That was the old days. These are the new days. New days call for new ways. Plotting priests, carrying the ark on their shoulders, slow. And since David wants the ark in Jerusalem yesterday, let's put it on an ox cart and make it easier for everyone. And that's what they do. They're breaking the law, but they do it anyway. And David appointed the priests Uzzah and Ahio to be the keepers of the ark. Ahia is in front, perhaps leading the oxen. Uzzah walks beside the ark. Uh, But during the journey, the oxen stumble, the cart trembles, the ark wobbles. Uzzah reaches out his hand to steady it. It's a reflex action. Anyone would do it. You'd do it. But when he touches the ark, God kills him on the spot. Strikes him dead, right beside the ark. Brutal. And David is livid. He can't believe that God would kill Uzzah for trying to steady his ark. Ark on a cart, maybe not the best way, but ark on its side on the ground, way worse. David is angry and he's scared because he sees Uzzah's body right there on the ground, puts the fear of the Lord into David. He calls a halt to the the whole parade, leaves the ark at the nearby house of Obed-Edom, and mopes his way back to Jerusalem. His victory parade turns into a funeral procession, 
And David fusses, pouts, and talks to himself all the way back to Jerusalem. But David's loss is Obed-Edom's gain. Housing the ark creates a windfall for him. His ship comes in. God blesses him because the ark, the symbol of God's power and presence, is on his property. So David's anger doesn't last forever. He gets over it. He works it out with the Lord. He gets word that God is blessing Obed-Edom. And so he decides to try again. And he did it right this time. The priests are carrying the ark, slow, but God's way. And when they enter the gates of Jerusalem, it's party time. It is an epic worship party that you'd probably never see in a Baptist church. But hey, some days you got to dance, right? You got to loosen up the chains and dance. Hear the word of the Lord. It was reported to King David. The Lord blessed Obed-Edom's family and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and had the ark of God brought up from Obed-Edom's house to the city of David with rejoicing. When those carrying the ark of the Lord advanced six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened calf. David was dancing with all his might before the Lord, wearing a linen ephod. He and the whole house of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of the ram's horn. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Saul's daughter, Michal, looked down from the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent David had pitched for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and fellowship offerings in the Lord's presence. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of armies. And then he distributed a loaf of bread, a date cake, and a raisin cake to each one in the entire Israelite community, both men and women. Then all the people went home. When David returned home to bless his household, Saul's daughter, Michal, came out to meet him. How the king of Israel honored himself today, she said. He exposed himself today in the sight of the slave girls of his subjects like a vulgar person would expose himself. David replied to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me over your father and his whole family to appoint me ruler over the Lord's people of Israel. I will dance before the Lord and I will dishonor myself and humble myself even more. However, by the slave girls you spoke about, I will be honored. And Saul's daughter, Michal, had no child till the day of her death. Some party, huh? And why not? Getting the ark home was a big deal. I mean, it was worth celebrating. So as David and his contingent carried the ark to Jerusalem, David was offering sacrifices. He was dancing and leaping before the Lord. It it wasn't manufactured either. This was not the half-hearted square dancing that my generation was forced to do in junior high gym class. This was Louisiana Saturday night. I mean, a holy hoedown, a divine disco, a heavenly hip-hop. No stale ritual in David's worship. This was spontaneous. It was from his heart to his feet to the Lord. The ark was home. In the heart of Jerusalem, in the heart of God's people, front and center, exactly where it's supposed to be. Party time, a welcome home worship party. One of those days when you got to dance to the Lord and praise his name. And David was so red bulled up with joy that he led the way. You'd figure everybody would join this party, right? The ark had history. Moses' history, Exodus' history, conquest history. People had heard the stories. Few had ever seen the ark. And now the ark was coming home. A huge day for Israel. Historic. Worship time, party time, all rolled into one. People shouting, trumpets blaring, dancing in the streets. David dishing out bread and cakes as party favors to everyone who came. Surely everybody joins this party, right? Wrong. Michal didn't. That's David's wife, and she was in no mood to party. She saw David out there dancing half-dressed, dancing up a storm, acting very unking-like makes her gag, and you know, you know people like Michal. At the end of the big win, when the teammates, her teammates prepare to pour the Gatorade over the coach's back, Michal's the one who says, I don't think we ought to be doing that. And when her 
when her child comes home from school bouncing in the door, flashing the blue ribbon he won for getting first place at the science fair at school. Michal's the mom who says, would you get hold of yourself? It's not like you cured cancer or anything. And when her brother gets good news and shouts for glee, Michal's the sister who says, would you grow up? That's Michal, captain of the cold water brigade. Mother Superior of the Sisters of the Wet Blanket. Do you know her? Are you like her? One dead cold woman right there. She saw David dancing like a fool in front of God and everybody, acting like some goofy winner on Family Feud, and it disgusted her. She made no bones about it when David came home. I mean, picture the scene. David's still on cloud nine. He is still filled up with the worship and with the glory of God. He had just blessed his people. Now he was coming home to bless his family. And Michal is at the door to meet him. Arms crossed, shaking her head, a scowl on her face, giving that wifely look that wives kind of have. And stinging sarcasm in her words. Well, aren't you the distinguished king? Stripped half naked, dancing like a street urchin in front of slave girls and everybody else. I hope you're proud of yourself because you have embarrassed me. That's me, Cal. Party pooper. I mean, how'd she get so sour? Did she learn it from her daddy? Remember, Michal is the daughter of King Saul, a prideful man who had these incredible mood swings and prone to temper tantrums. So maybe growing up in one of those walk-on eggshell environments, might Michal learn to suppress her feelings and numb herself to what was going on around her? Maybe she was afraid to feel. I, I understand that. Or maybe she was a proud woman, easily embarrassed. The linen ephod that David was wearing as he danced, it didn't have the coverage of modern underwear. With all the dancing he was doing, all the jumping and leaping, he may have accidentally exposed himself somewhere in the process. I mean, so what if her dad, King Saul, had stripped himself naked and danced with the prophets one day? David isn't her dad. He's her husband, and no wife likes that, even if he is carried away with worship. As commentator Robin Branch, Branch observes, it was one thing for a king to spread his sexual favors around in his harem, the privacy of his harem, but to make a public exhibition of himself before every servant girl who chose to ogle at his energetic converting was something else. It's offensive to a wife. I get that. Maybe Michal was embarrassed. Or maybe she was superficial. A person more concerned with appearance than substance. Maybe she lived in fear of looking bad thinking she had to present the noble, royal, mannequin in a store window front image to the public. Maybe that just goes with royalty. I mean, I don't, I don't remember a time, and I don't think any Englanders remember a time when Queen Elizabeth ever cut a rug like David did on this day in Jerusalem. I mean, maybe that's all part of the pretension of royalty. But David wasn't from a royal family. He was from a rural family. He had a bunch of brothers probably piled into the same bed on cold nights, probably ate with their elbows on the table, probably burped whenever they felt like it. They didn't live in a palace either. Expect they had a washing machine on the front porch and maybe some old pickup truck on blocks out in the front yard and this mangy border collie named Duke who laid under the rickety front porch. I mean, David's family were shepherds. They were earthy people, and not people known for worrying about appearances. They were passionate people, attuned to the rhythms of nature. Life was never safe for them. It was always risk. Weather, wolves, and the price of wool were the things with which they, they wrestled day after day after day. Nothing pretentious about these people. They lived largely, they felt deeply, and they engaged their experiences passionately. For David, that spirit carried over into his relationship with the Lord. The man knew God. I mean, read the Psalms, holy smokes. What intimacy David had with God. The passion, the praise, the, the fear, the rage, the doubt, the confidence, the, the penitence, the thanksgiving. Now, Michal, she, she tried to manage God. She tried to keep God at a distance, never let him get too close, uh, never, never feel him too deeply. Eugene Peterson observed for Michal, God was a, a social amenity. He was a political backer. 
David was a polar opposite. He didn't try to manage God usually, not always, but usually he let God manage him. David didn't try to keep God at a distance either. He courted intimacy. He courted personal relationship. When Uzzah touched the ark and died, David got mad at God. David pouted before God. And when the ark finally came home, David did a, a jig of joy. Break dancing, moonwalking all over Jerusalem Square. David didn't just think about God in his head. He had a great affection for him in his heart. David felt God in his emotions and he freely expressed what he felt. And he didn't let the cold water brigade rain on his parade. After Michal lectured him about what an embarrassment he was, David didn't slink away. He didn't regret anything. He didn't slap his head and say, I can't believe I did that. What in the world was I thinking? No, after a nasty little cheap shot about how God had chosen him over her father, David said flatly, I will dance before the Lord and I will dishonor myself and I will humble myself even more and those people who can see beyond my dance to my heart, they will honor me for it. David wasn't doing a Fred Astaire or a Michael Jackson or a Beyonce out there. He wasn't putting on a show. He wasn't dancing for people. He was dancing before the Lord, and he didn't give a flip what anybody thought about him either. He was going to dance whether anybody else heard the music or not. Now, those for whom worship is a show, those who worship to be seen, those who try to use God to look good, they can never and will never understand David's dance of praise. Some people find that expression of worship undignified and, and foolish. And I understand that because there are many ways to worship. This is not the only way. Sometimes worship is quiet. It's, it's contemplative. It's reflective. But some days you got to dance. Sometimes the Lord touches you in such a way that you can't help but kick up your heels, raise your hands and shout hallelujah. If you're reserved by nature... And the Lord touches you like that, you get real conflicted about what to do with it, don't you? I understand. I grew up in the Presbyterian church. And I, I can't speak for all Presbyterian churches, but you talk about unexpressive, unemotional worship. My soul. But you know, when I became a Baptist, my wor experience of Baptist worship wasn't expressive either, except for the occasional amen. And when I got here, Dr. McCorder was good for amens at all the wrong places whenever we had worship services. Years ago, honestly, I used to think that it bordered on blasphemy for people to clap their hands in a worship service. I thought that raising hands was, should have a sign on it that said Pentecostals only. Well, I've changed. Some of you have been around long enough to see my evolution in worship. I've grown in my freedom to express worship to God, to let what's in my heart come out in physical ways. And now I feel free to say hallelujah, to raise my hands, to even, you know, tap dance if the Lord were to give me a spirit urge for such a thing. Now, I'm not criticizing those who are not comfortable with that kind of worship. That was me forever. I get that. But David sets an example here, and I encourage more freedom to worship in physical ways. And if the Lord, and here's the deal, if the Lord never touches your soul in worship to the point of some kind of emotive expression, whether it's joyful singing or hand clapping or kneeling or arm raising or even doing a little jig of joy, you may have a problem. You may be superficial. You may be more consumed with yourself than, and with your image than you are with God. If, like Michal, you look, you look down on contempt and pity at the Davids of this world in their expressions of worship, then you've got another problem. Alexander White's line on Michal gets to the heart of it. Those who are deaf always despise those who dance. So where are you in all of this? David's story can be like a mirror for us. What do you see? 
this were a play and, and you were cast for one of these parts, would the director cast you as David? Or would he cast you as Michal? Is your heart ever white hot for Jesus or is it always cold and sterile there? Are there ever times when the Lord stirs a dance or do you resist his touch? Is your worship skin deep or does it go so deep that it has to get out some way? David's spirit of worship does not require that you bust out in some Irish jig or street dance. It does mean that if you feel so inclined, you will do it without worrying about what anybody else thinks. David's spirit of worship means that you have so much passion for God that you can't keep it inside even if you wanted to. It means that there are occasions when you worship when like a shaken up bottle of Coke, the pressure of your passion is so great, it is going to get out. Other people are going to see it. Other people are going to feel it when you worship like David. And David's spirit of worship also means this. You are not embarrassed about your love for God. You don't care if folks at work know. You don't care if your classmates know, your family knows, your teammates know, your golfing buddies, hunting buddies, fishing buddies, bridge club buddies. You don't care if they know. In fact, they can't help but know when you have a heart like David's. So this story is a good mirror for us. And not only as individuals, but as a church. Is our corporate worship, is it heartfelt and soul deep or is it superficial and shallow? Are we more concerned about how we look as we worship than whether God takes joy in our worship? Are we so busy critiquing the music and the structure and the lighting and the sermon that we don't even notice God? Passionate worship is one of the most evangelistic things that we can do because passionate worship declares that God is alive and that God is real and that God is alive and real in us. Boring worship, dead worship, you know what that communicates. God is boring. God is dead. There's too much of that kind of worship. Got a friend from college. His name's Ray. Maybe watching. Shout out, Ray, if you're watching. One night, uh, when he was a teenager, a Sunday night, he and his buddy were sitting in church near the back as usual. The service was boring as usual. This was down in one of the churches in El Dorado that will remain nameless. I don't, can't even remember which church it was. They were sitting behind a man who, who got so into the spirit of that worship that he fell asleep. Fell asleep with his arms draped over the back of the pew. Now, you don't put two, two teenage boys behind a guy like that. Bored teenage boys. One of them thought, hmm... What I have, I have string in my pocket. So they proceeded to tie the string around the cuff button of one of his sleeves to the cuff button of his other sleeve. And when the guy kind of half woke up to adjust positions in his nice nap, he couldn't move. And being half asleep, he uttered something that is not usually heard in church. And people around got all tickled, and the pastor noticed the commotion. And the pastor said, I think the influence of Satan is in our worship tonight, looking at my friend and his buddy. And one of them, I don't know which one, said, it ain't Satan. He got bored and left a long time ago. <laughs> hey, there's enough of that boring worship, that boring singing, boring preaching that goes on Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. The congregation is not interested. Satan is not threatened. And God's up in heaven stifling a yawn. Would you do your part to make sure that worship at First Baptist Hot Springs never becomes like that? 
Would you pray and foster the spirit of David in our corporate worship? Would you bring your heart and your soul to it? Would you sing enthusiastically, mask or no mask, online or on site? Would you engage in the public prayers and quietly say a few of your own? Would you listen with eager ears and open heart to any way that God might want to speak to you through his word? And if you worship online only right now, if you can't get out yet... Would you stick with us to the end instead of bailing out when the sermon is finished? Would you give God every precious second of our once a week gathering to worship him? Not every song, not every sermon is going to provoke a dance. But when God moves to moves you to express yourself in some way, to raise a hand, to shout amen, to clap your hands, to jump up and say hallelujah, to weep a few tears, do it. Now, I know it, it feels risky, a little uncomfortable. I mean, if we, we were to worship like, who knows what might happen every Sunday. It'd be an adventure just showing up to church. Now, this is going to make some of us uncomfortable. And this is going to make some of us mad. I'm not asking for us to quit being Baptists and start being Pentecostals. I'm just asking that for whatever it looks like for you, that we be more like David and less like Michal. I'm asking for heartfelt worship that feels free to offer God whatever God prompts you to offer because some days you got to dance. I heard about a kid with happy feet. She can't help it. I mean, that's who she is. Some kids squeal with delight, and some kids clap their hands, and she does a little jig. Tell her you're taking her to Chick-fil-A, and she does a little dance step. Stream Minions on Netflix, and she spins around on the floor and does a tap dance on the, in the living room. Toss gummy bears in the cart at Walmart, and she moonwalks down the aisle. Tell her it's time for Sunday school, and she does an Irish jig all the way to her classroom. One Sunday, one of her Sunday school teachers, I think, I think her name was Michal, said to the girl's mom, good grief. Don't her jigs and her pirouettes ever get on your nerves and embarrass you? Mom smiled. We just worry that someday she'll stop. Father, would you please release us from the fear of what others think about us and stir deeper affection in our hearts toward you. Please take our hearts, our minds, our mouths, our hands, and our feet and give us freedom to employ them in acts of worship that honor you and give you full-bodied glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Whether you're online or on site today, now is the time to respond. You can do that online or on site by taking your phone and typing the word action to 94,000. You'll get some links there that will give you an opportunity to let us know what God's stirring in your life. If you're, he, if you're watching or, or you're here in the room and you don't know Jesus, I pray that he stirred you to come to know him as Savior and Lord. He is alive. He is real. He will change your life, forgive your sins. I invite you to throw yourself at his mercy and give him your life. He'll take it from there and he'll grow you for the rest of your days until you live for him forever. I invite you to make that commitment today. I invite you, Christian, to ask God to help you, help you worship him more freely. For some of us, that means peeling back some of the, some of the armor that we put around our heart to keep us from feeling God too deeply. We need to break that open so that we can feel him more deeply. When we feel him deeply, it will express physically in some way. Some of us need to pray for that. I encourage you to give it a go. It's going to feel weird at first. It did for me. But after a while, you just feel so darn free in your worship that you just engage with God. I don't know. I can just speak for myself. It just helps me engage a little more a little more deeply. Maybe it'll work that way for you. I don't know. But I want you to feel free to offer God whatever he prompts you to offer him.
And I, and I encourage you to join the church. God puts that in your life here without a church home. Come join us here. You can do that online. You can do that on site as we'll have ministers right here at the front to receive you when we sing this last hymn of response, which we'll do now. So let's stand together as we sing. You respond as God moves in your heart.